Hi, I'm Bill Fleming. You know that phrase, those who stay will be champions, reflects the proud championship spirit and tradition of the Michigan Wolverines. In 1982, Michigan's 103rd year of college football competition, Coach Bo Schembechler and his young men in maize and blue continued this tradition, winning the Big Ten Conference Championship and another trip to the Rose Bowl. Now there's no question the 1982 was a season that graphically demonstrated the University of Michigan's commitment to athletic excellence. But the university's commitment to student athletes goes much deeper than providing a first-rate athletic program. It's also a commitment to offering a first-rate academic program, which in the long run is the most important aspect of the college experience. With this combined approach of athletic and academic excellence, it's no wonder that Michigan consistently attracts the finest student athletes in the country. You have to have both the academics and the football. And we're fortunate here at Michigan because we have an outstanding school academically and we have a quality football program. If a football program is to be evaluated, the first thing you evaluate is um, what effect has it had on the youngsters that have played. And the most important effect you have to have is that they come out of there with a degree uh, to bring them in and play them and keep them eligible and then suddenly they're gone and uh, they go in as a college dropout to get a job because they haven't gotten a degree I think they've been cheated. A viable degree is important if you're going to be successful. Uh, success in life is dependent upon how hard you work. If you work you're going to be successful. If you don't work you're not. It's my job as a football coach to impress upon them the years that they're here, the importance of getting the degree. The university offers degrees in more than 150 subjects, allowing each student to choose the course of study that will best prepare him for the future. And in pursuing higher education at Michigan, students are choosing from among the finest academic programs in the nation. Barron's Magazine calls the University of Michigan a place of higher learning that is virtually unparalleled. The survey of college deans and presidents ranks the university as one of the top 10 most influential academic institutions in the nation. That influence is evident when you consider that Michigan is also among the top five schools in the nation for turning out business leaders. Of the 19 academic departments in the university, 15 are ranked among the nation's finest. And overall, the University of Michigan's undergraduate program is ranked third behind only Harvard and Princeton. As a national leader in academics, coupled with its outstanding athletic tradition, Michigan offers student athletes a unique opportunity for success in the classroom and on the field. The Wolverines' long record of success on the field has made them one of the most watched, listened to, and followed college football teams in the nation. During home games, more than 100,000 loyal fans pack Michigan Stadium each Saturday to cheer on the maize and blue. For the past nine years, Michigan has led the nation in attendance. Last year, averaging a record 105,000 for each home game. Counting both home and away games, the team has played before more than one million spectators in each of the last eight years. And even more people follow Bo Schembechler and the Wolverines on television, radio, and in the press. Michigan is one of the most televised football teams in America. And during Bo's 14 years of leadership, the team has appeared 32 times on ABC and CBS's NCAA College Football Series. That's the maximum number of appearances allowed under NCAA rules. In addition to this television exposure, each Michigan game is broadcast by several radio stations and covered by more than 300 photographers and reporters for leading magazines and newspapers. This kind of television, radio, magazine, and newspaper coverage, and loyal fan support just isn't found at every university. But it is found at the University of Michigan. And it's here because of the university's dedication to athletic excellence. A dedication that includes a complete football program featuring the finest in coaching and in facilities. Everything that we do must be first class. The great innovation in football in the last 
five to ten years has been the development of the individual player physically. So we feel that all of the uh, weight training equipment, if it's good, and has been proven to be good, we're going to make sure we have it on this campus. We've also uh, hired Mike Gittleson, a physiology of exercise guy who knows everything there is about the development of the human body. And uh, he's done a tremendous job for us, and our players are sold on it for two reasons. One, it makes them a better player, and two, it helps prevent injuries. So that phase of our program, uh, we make sure is first class. Our medical people, uh, Dr. Jerry O'Connor and uh, Dr. Anderson, our internal medicine guy, they are um, uh, outstanding people in sports medicine. And Russ Miller is a great trainer. He's done uh, a great job for us. And uh, so we're very innovative. We, everything that's modern in, uh, in sports medicine, we're going to have here. And of course, the latest facility is the indoor field house. And it's a beautiful structure because it's an entire football field under roof with artificial turf. You could actually play a football game in there if you wanted to. You've got an excellent uh, locker room facility, uh, air-conditioned meeting rooms, artificial practice field with lights. And so all of those things, I think, add to the quality of the program. If I've done anything that has been successful here at Michigan, I've surrounded myself with the finest coaches in the United States of America. And that's been proven down through the years. Men who, like myself, believe that a football program, in order to be successful, must be player-oriented first. And so all of those things we are able to do, because uh, if football is the sport that is going to bring in all the money that runs the entire athletic program here at the University of Michigan, then those people that are in that program should have everything first class. A first-class football program demands a first-class leader, and no one has earned that reputation more than Bo Schembechler. In 14 years at Michigan, Bo has coached the Wolverines to 10 Big Ten titles, 12 top 10 national rankings. His leadership has taken the Maize and Blue to 10 postseason bowl games, including seven Rose Bowl appearances. Overall, Bo's victories give him a winning percentage of 83%. Under Coach Shem Beckler, 29 players have been picked first team All-American. 77 players, all Big Ten. And more than 100 Wolverines have been drafted by the NFL. With this track record of building winning teams and winning individuals, head coach Bo Shem Beckler has become one of the most successful collegiate coaches in football history. The 1982 season got off to a thrilling start at home against Wisconsin. In the second quarter, trailing 9-7, the Wolverines put together a touchdown drive to take the lead. And in the fourth quarter, Steve Smith's touchdown run capped a 20-9 Wolverine victory to avenge 1981's loss to the Badgers. Michigan's schedule now called for two non-conference games. Notre Dame was first. We traveled to South Bend to go against Notre Dame. It was our first road game of the season, first non-conference game of the season, and our first night game. Early on, we made some costly mistakes. Smith and Ricks collided on a handoff. The ball got loose. Notre Dame recovered and took advantage of the recovery by going 24 yards for a touchdown. Earlier, another turnover on our part allowed them to kick a field goal and lead 10 to nothing. Then in the third quarter, Anthony Carter helped us close the gap by taking a punt return 72 yards to score. This made it 13 to seven. Later, we pulled off one of the most unusual touchdowns I've ever seen. Smith passed to Johnson, the ball popped loose, and Rick Rogers picked it off the back of a Notre Dame player, then ran for a 39-yard touchdown. And we were only down by six points. In the fourth quarter, we had a chance to pull it out. We moved from our 20-yard line to the Notre Dame 35. Smith passed to Bean, but the ball was stripped from Bean's hands and Notre Dame came out on top 23 to 17. We didn't play well enough to win, but we could have won the game had we been able to score in that last drive. The following week, we were back in Ann Arbor to meet UCLA. It looked like the game was going our way as the offense performed strongly and jumped out to a 21 to nothing lead. 
Then came a critical play that allowed UCLA to get back in the game. On third down and 25 yards to go, their fine passing quarterback Tom Ramsey connected with Williams for a 46-yard touchdown. They scored again, and at halftime we were ahead 24 to 14. In the third quarter, Williams returned our kickoff following a field goal for 65 yards, giving UCLA excellent field position. They eventually scored on a two-yard run and went ahead. We battled back and drove to the UCLA eight-yard line, but time ran out. The 31 to 27 loss made us one and two on the season. It was a difficult defeat to accept because we had every opportunity to win this game and should have. Against Indiana the following Saturday, the Wolverines began their march to the Rose Bowl. Ali Haji Sheik's 50-yard field goal gave Michigan an early 3-0 lead. Michigan's spectacular running game dominated the Hoosiers, with Steve Smith and Larry Ricks both breaking loose for long touchdowns. The 24-10 victory gave Michigan a 2-0 record in the conference. And now everyone's attention turned to the classic football rivalry, Michigan versus Michigan State. In the first quarter, all-American Anthony Carter set up a Michigan touchdown with the 51-yard punt return. Later, Carter pulled down a 61-yard pass from Steve Smith that opened the door for another Michigan TD. The offensive attack was backed up by a strong Wolverine defense. When the clock wound down, it was Michigan 31, Michigan State 17. We were undefeated in the Big Ten as we went on the road to face the Iowa Hawkeyes. This was a key game in our Big Ten title drive. Iowa was also undefeated in the conference play, and they were defending their 1981 championship. After a scoreless first quarter, Iowa drove to our one-yard line and were set up to take the lead. But they fumbled on the way to the end zone, and Marion Body recovered. After a field goal and a safety gave us five points, we put together our first touchdown drive of the game. Our defense played well, stopping Iowa, holding them to only one touchdown late in the fourth quarter. We came away from the Iowa game with a 29-7 win, a 4-0 conference record, and sole possession of the number one spot in the Big Ten standings. Against Northwestern the following Saturday, Michigan's Big Ten record moved to 5-0 as they rolled to a decisive 49-14 victory over the Wildcats. The Minnesota contest was another example of a powerful Michigan offensive attack dominating the game. Quarterback Steve Smith passed for three TDs on the way to a 52-14 victory. Michigan now needed only two more wins in their final three games to become the conference champions. We headed into the Illinois game with a 6-0 conference record but we knew this would be a tough, hard-fought game. Illinois had the best passing offense in the league, and I felt it would all come down to who played the best fourth quarter. Illinois scored first on the field goal, but we came back to take the lead when Steve Smith tossed a 40-yard touchdown pass to Anthony Carter. We led seven to three. It was a defensive battle, but Illinois broke through to tie the game 10 to 10 at the half. In the second half, Ali Haji Sheik got us six points with two long field goals. With a score 16 to 10, Illinois had the ball late in the fourth quarter. They drove deep into our territory. It was up to our defense now to preserve the victory. It all came down to one critical play. They had it on the two yard line, fourth down and goal to go. We gambled that they'd run. They tried, but Jerry Burgeis' key tackle at the line of scrimmage shut the door. This was a great defensive stand at the goal line and the key to our Big Ten championship. And that championship was wrapped up the following week against Purdue. The Wolverines' strong, consistent defensive play caused several Boilermaker turnovers. The Michigan offense capitalized on these turnovers. Steve Smith connected with Anthony Carter for a 48-yard TD. Lawrence Ricks broke loose for 52 yards to set up another Michigan score. The Wolverines would go on to score five more touchdowns that day, including this amazing TD reception by Anthony Carter. Final score, 
Michigan 52, Purdue 21. Even though we had the Big Ten title and were headed for the Rose Bowl, that didn't change anything in the final game of the season. It was still Michigan versus Ohio State. Unfortunately, our performance was less than we'd expected. We committed six turnovers, which gave Ohio State the opportunity to score. Yet, even with these turnovers, the game was close. In the third quarter, Steve Smith ran for a touchdown to tie the score at 14 all. But late in the fourth quarter, deep in our own territory, we turned the ball over again. Ohio State recovered and then took it in for the go-ahead touchdown. The final score saw Ohio State on top 24 to 14 in a game that was decided by turnovers. In going into the 1982 season, we knew we had enormous graduation losses from a year ago. But we also know that the Michigan program has been built on championships, that every year we never think in terms of a rebuilding year. We think in terms of winning the championship. And as soon as we got into the season and won our first game against Wisconsin, even though we lost two non-conference games, we were still confident we could win the championship. And our team got better and better as each week went by and we chalked up victories in the Big Ten Conference until by the end of the 10th game, we had clinched the championship and the right to go back to the Rose Bowl. And so it was an exciting season from that standpoint. And I think this team, the 1982 team, typifies Michigan football. You must improve and get better each week. You must have great leadership from your seniors. You must believe that you can always win every time you take the field because you are Michigan. And when you play at Michigan, you win championships. The Rose Bowl is the culmination of a successful season, a Big Ten championship, and an opportunity to play in the greatest postseason game there is in Pasadena, California. We arrived in Pasadena on Christmas Day, and the following day we went to Disneyland. The festivities were fun. Even Anthony Carter, our All-American wide receiver, learned a few new moves. The following night, we went to Lowry's restaurant for a roast beef dinner. Lowry's is a famous uh, restaurant on the West Coast, and the roast beef is the finest we have eaten anywhere. And then the Big Ten Dinner of Champions in the evening at the Hollywood Palladium. The practices we had in the West Coast were crisp and sharp. Everybody was working hard, uh, wanting to do well and to win the Rose Bowl game. On Friday, the last day of preparation, more than 5,000 Michigan fans showed up at our practice field for a momentous pep rally. It certainly gave our team a great lift. Everywhere you go, Michigan supporters have followed our team and have given us the spirit and enthusiasm uh, to play our hardest. In the Rose Bowl, Michigan was pitted once again against UCLA. And although some observers thought that the loss of quarterback Steve Smith and Rich Springer to injuries would mean a decisive Bruin victory, Michigan battled and kept the game close. In the fourth quarter with the score UCLA 17, Michigan 7, a key goal line stand by the Wolverine defense stopped UCLA. But on Michigan's next possession, the Bruins intercepted a pass and returned it for a touchdown. The Wolverines continued to fight back and narrowed the final score to 24-14. I hate losing, but in this particular game, I thought our team played extremely hard, and I was very, very proud of their performance. In 1982, the University of Michigan continued its proud tradition of athletic and academic excellence. And by offering this unique blend of experiences to students, Michigan prepares them for the future. It's a preparation, I think, that can best be evidenced by the long list of Michigan graduates who have gone on to success both on and off the field. Jonas Salk, whose work at Michigan led to the vaccination against polio. Jim Smith, 
of the Pittsburgh Steelers. Famous actor James Earl Jones. Dwight Hicks, San Francisco 49ers. Journalist Mike Wallace. Randy Logan, Philadelphia Eagles. Playwright Arthur Miller. Rob Lytle, Denver Broncos. Clarence Darrow. Butch Woolfolk, New York Giants. Astronaut Jack Lausman, one of four Michigan astronauts, three of whom comprise the entire crew of the Apollo 15. Rick Leach, Detroit Tigers. And Gerald Ford. I'm proud to say that I'm a Michigan graduate and a member of the largest living alumni body in the entire world. For when all is considered, among the great colleges across America, the spirit and the tradition of the University of Michigan stands alone. And those who stay will be champions. Play at Michigan and win championships.